<clears throat> I'm Rana, and as you all know, uh, we've spent the last like six or seven Tuesdays all kind of focused on local nonprofit organizations, partly thinking about the season uh, rather than just thinking about what kind of stuff you can buy, think about ways to get involved in our community and to both work and otherwise support organizations that are doing good work. So tonight I'm joined by Constance Christofik from uh, New London Landmarks. So welcome, Constance. Hi, Rana. Thanks for having me here. And I guess I'll start out. I know you've been in this position for over a year, but in some ways I'm sure people still think of you as being the new director of Landmarks. So how has the last year been? Um, well, I still feel new, <laughs> although not as new anymore. Um, definitely the year, just learning curve, finding out what's existing, what we do, um, meet everyone, still meeting everyone in the community. Um, and, um, but now I feel a little more confident and a little more organized and, um, but I, I love doing everything. The job, I have told people over the holidays, visiting my family, I finally found a job that's satisfying and fulfilling, so. I'm really happy. Now, your background is related to historic preservation, right? Way back when. I, <laughs> I started school in historic preservation. I did, I did volunteer work in Bethlehem, historic Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, did some architectural research, and then just got away from it. But I've been in nonprofits, you know, for over a decade. Right. So. And New London, of course, if you're thinking about historic preservation, it's a gold mine here. Perfect, yeah. Some of it not that easily accessible, but <laughs> it's there. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit just generally about what Landmarks does. Well, Land Landmarks is the local preservation organization. It's preserving architecture. It's um, the mission is with urban development and open space, as you know, with past experience with Riverside Park. Right. So, um, so. Yeah, and New London is such a, a, an old city, like even the parks are, you know, historic. And the cemeteries. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I learned about a cemetery. Maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I know if you go to the website on New London Landmarks, it talks about preservation as economic development. Uh, how does that work? Well, um, I haven't formally answered that question before, so okay. I'm winging it. You can think. Um, so the economic development comes from the investment that individual homeowners, developers, municipalities put into their existing architecture. And um, one, it's green. You're not demolishing, putting things in the landfill. You're not using new raw materials to build buildings. So it's definitely, you know, eco-friendly. And, um, and then you're sometimes repurposing something um, that wasn't used at all, and it's adding to the economy um, through the use and, and, the act and the activity and, and the whole contribution it makes to the, the neighborhood. You know, to, I moved to New London 20 years ago, and I worked at the hospital, so I was, and I used to ride my bike to work. So I wanted to, to look at a house within five or six miles of the hospital. And I looked at houses in both New London and Waterford, and we discovered after we had looked at about 50 houses, I think, that we liked every house in New London <laughs> better than every house in Waterford. I mean, there's just so much more character when yes. you're thinking about what went into building the houses 100 and 150 years ago as opposed to in the 70s and 80s, that there, there was really no comparison. Yeah. And the materials are still there. They Just, are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I must admit, we've done some redoing, so we have put some stuff in the landfill, but yeah. a lot of materials could be reused. You know, yeah. floors that were under the carpet downstairs mm. ended up in the bedrooms yeah. upstairs. So there's so much more opportunity for creativity. It's yeah. a lot of fun. Um, now, when we were talking before the show, you mentioned something about New London having a lot of historic districts. Now, without listing all of mm -hmm. them, 
uh, because it's a really long list. Can you talk a little bit about some of the historic districts that stand out in New London? Um, sure. So we have um, downtown New London. We have the Hemp's, where the Hempstead House is and up oh. Hempstead Street. We have the Post Hill, the Granite Street um, area. Um, we have um, near the Garfield Mill, there's oh. an area there. Um, the Coit Street Historic District, which uh, we may yeah. talk about. Um, um, so there's a lot, and it, it puts, um, it, this is a national register for historic preservation, and we now have one state historic district, which is the West Coit Street Historic District. Now, if people buy houses, because many of these districts have residential properties mm -hmm. as well as, as others that are more commercial, um, does it mean anything to them that they can they're buying it? Do they get any tangible advantages or? Well, the most um, tangible um, benefit is historic tax credits. So if you're in a state or national historic district, or if individually your building is listed, you're eligible for historic tax credits. And so if you're doing any kind of construction project from windows to roof to siding, um, and you're restoring your house, um, by giving an application, outlining the work you're going to do, it's reviewed by the state, and you can get refunded. When the project's finished, um, you can get money for it. So, um, but yeah. of course, it has to abide by certain guidelines. Sure. So, um, but it, it really, the money that you gain allows you to afford to do something that high and the right. quality. So. Um, so that's one of the benefits. And otherwise, it's just kind of nominal, um, you know, that you're part of um, a district that's been researched historically. And so. yeah, I, I sometimes feel that on the East Coast here, we kind of take this kind of thing for granted. You know, the house we live in was built in around 1890. And, you know, in New London, that isn't that impressive. You know, it's a little older than the average, but not by much. Yeah. Um, and then when our relatives from the West Coast visited, that the oldest building in Salem, Oregon is like maybe 10 years older than our house. And they were just so impressed. And here is this thing in our, you know, front yard, backyard that we have as a resource and we just don't even think of it as anything that great. Yeah. So you think it's like taken for granted? I think yeah. sometimes it is, um, I, I, not, not exclusively, but we'll yeah. talk about some yeah. endangered houses um, after a while too. Okay. And um, I do think that sometimes we don't appreciate what we have here. And we have a lot. <laughs> we do have yeah. a, a tremendous amount. Um, so, you know, Looking back at, at New London Landmarks, I think, was formed in the 70s. 76. And it was to save the train station. Mm -hmm. So that was um, quite a success story. It's a beautiful building now. It didn't get raised. It didn't you know, get replaced. Um, but what would you say, in your mind, are a couple of other like preservation success stories that have really made a difference to New London. Oh, I don't have such a long history here. Yeah, they don't have to be old ones. They can be new ones. Well, of course, the one that I'm most involved with is what's going on in the Coit Street Historic District, that Tony Silvestri is creating this city flats project. Um, a lot of it's in progress now, but um, New London Landmarks worked with him to provide all the research on the buildings um, so that he could apply for tax credits and make renovations abiding by national standards for rehabilitation. So um, I'm happy he's doing it yeah. with this process. And, um, and we've already visibly seen some of the houses are, are complete. Right. Um, so in that neighborhood is so in desperate need of of repair, so. And I think he, he spoke at maybe one of your annual meetings. I, I think I remember his saying that they wanted to start out with the buildings that were in worse shape. Yes. The ones that were really dragging the neighborhood down. Yes, 
and then filter out and do some more. So a whole, uh, the potential for the neighborhood to be transformed is, is, is high. So. so what's the status of that right now? I see a couple of buildings that look maybe almost ready to move into. The one is completely ready, one's nearby. Um, if anyone wants to stop in the New London Landmarks office, 49 Washington Street, we have the latest newsletter. Um, and there's a whole article with some before and after photos of some of the houses that are done. So um, they could stop in and say hi and <laughs> take a look at that. But um, um, yes, and I think over the next few months, each the next house that's being worked on will be complete, and, and then he'll be starting new ones. It'll be a layered yeah. process. And you said that's a, a, and that neighborhood must be really quite old because it's near the downtown. It is. It was really interesting. It was a cove that came up to um, the Coit oh, right. Street. Um, Coit oh. Street runs like, and then curves towards the Hempstead House. That whole area was a cove at one point. So, and then behind the Shaw Mansion. Um, yeah, it's a really old neighborhood. So, um, Yeah. Well, it, it's nice to see it. And the houses are still there, so... Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Well, really, it, <laughs> yeah, I don't can't even recall seeing much in the way of new construction yeah. there. Everything is the old building. If anything, um, there's an area that's missing, which was a, a silk mill, and then there was another oh. type of mill, and now um, there's some open space there. Oh yeah. So potential for a future park. Um, Who well, knows? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's kind of interesting. So. Yeah. What else is going on in, in New London in terms of renovation? Um, well, what, a building that was on our endangered list that is now off is 25 Cleveland Street. It is oh. this gigantic home, um, not far off, it's off of Broad Street near Sheffield Pharmaceuticals. Okay. And oh, I think there's four or 5,000 square feet. Um, oh, wow. Carriage house, and but everything was needed electrical, plumbing, roof, you name it. Um, a lot of work needs to be put into it. But um, a woman from an, the other part of Connecticut purchased it, and we, we have high hopes for, for it. Wow. But it, had, it was vacant for a long time. So uh, we like to see homes that have been empty. Um, get some TLC. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the challenges. You see these great buildings around New London, and we need like 5,000 5, more people to move in yeah, yeah. and fill up all the spaces and yeah. figure out creative things to do in mm -hmm. them. Um, you know, I took s some pictures of some of the properties that are on the endangered list, so mm -hmm. I think maybe we can show them and not really talk about them in detail, but. I also wanted to invite people who are watching, if you want to call in, if you have any of these, not just buildings, but other property kinds of properties that, um, that you might have a sp specific interest in or idea for. Um, I think it might be really interesting, uh, but we'll have to wait just a minute because we're getting a little bit of a, oh no, actually we don't, okay. And the first one, City Hall. <laughs> and, you know, many of us who have gone to all of these, you know, go to city council meetings, go to planning and zoning meetings, and then you look at the ceiling. And um, so, I don't know, it's on the endangered list. What, what do you see as a future for City Hall? Um. Well, obviously the city is, is making the steps to take care of it with, uh, seeking grants. Uh, I, I think they received an architectural planning grant to help do the study to make the future repairs. And then that would require, you know, another grant to get that money. And, right. and um, it's a process. It's a slow process, but um, they care. They're working on it. And we're also there to help. Like if we find grant opportunities, that'll be a match for it. Um, we'll point it out or help apply. You know, it depends on uh, the criteria for the grant, but we're always looking. So. And I guess that, now I think this kind of points out some of the challenges that come when you want to renovate a building that obviously was built very well a long mm -hmm. time ago, but the problems aren't 
trivial, you know, old plumbing systems and old heating systems and materials like asbestos that were probably added along the way. And uh, so it's not a small job. No. <laughs> well, another publicly owned building, and I, I just did a couple of publicly owned buildings here that's been uh, in the news. I think it no longer has the for sale sign in the window. Oh, I didn't notice that. Oh, but I think it's still mm -hmm. for sale on the market. Yeah. Is, is the post office. Um, and again, any viewers who have any you know, ideas, this is a fantastic building. Yeah, oh, it is. And one of the big concerns was the murals, the Lafarge right. murals of the whaling industry that's presented in, in the lobby. And um, I have been informed that the RFP for the building sale includes includes a statement saying they must be preserved and protected. So that's a big concern and the efforts are being made. Um, but I don't know if they had any received any bids on it. No, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'd love, yeah. actually, I'd love to see the Postal Service do well and have this kind of building be able to be cared for in that way. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, in Willimannock, that the, their post office was converted to a brewery, a brew pub, um, about a dozen years ago. And it's been a very, it's a successful restaurant space. That's uh, great. A decade? I, yeah, mm -hmm. it wasn't there 25 years ago when I was going to school up there was still the post office. But yeah. yes, over yeah. about over the last 10 years, maybe even a little longer, the Willimannock Brewing Company. So, you know, what better would be <laughs> a brewing company across the street from the city hall? Be <laughs> well, restaurants do, do <laughs> rather well in our city. Yes, <laughs> they do. Yeah. And then the, one more, you know, that's been on the news, a Capitol Theater, and part of the reason this is kind of an old photo I found, and I wanted people to see what the windows look like mm -hmm. because, you know, it's almost hard to remember what it was like when it wasn't plywood. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't had a tour of the place inside. I've only seen photos. I haven't either. I would never been inside. And I understand it's just pretty much everything's gone, and it's like yeah. you're looking at a shell. So I, uh, probably our best hope is that the facade is preserved. Yeah. What we're looking at now. And um, actually yeah. that's realistic for yeah. a lot of preservation. The facade is really yeah. important, but modern building behind the facade, sometimes you got to do. Yeah. So there's, we'll look at some more after a, a while, but, uh, you had mentioned um, private individuals who fix up their houses. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the longstanding landmarks program has been the plaque program. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of houses in New London that have plaques on them. How do you get one? So <laughs> you send in an application or call us with um, your address. The, we do deed research. We go to City Hall and also look through city directories and any files we may have in our archives about the building. And um, we trace it back to the original owner. And um, so on the application, we say, do you know when the date was built? This is just to have, like, obviously we're going to find right. that out. But, um, but so we do that process. And then the plaque has uh, the name of the original owner and the year it was built. And um, I'm happy to say we're actually have, we're just about caught up. We, we had so many plaques and we had one volunteer doing the research and it required hours and hours to do a house, especially a lot of our old homes. But um, we have more volunteers. One of our board members is a retired professor. He's researching them. And um, we had someone else for a short term. Um, Anyway, we're in good shape, so anyone would like um, to request the plaque. Um, it's $250 for um, non-members, $235 for members. So that includes all the time and hours for the research and the plaque itself um, that's created. 
Now, how old does a house have to be to qualify it for a plaque? Only 50 years old. Um, so that's yeah. including a lot of 20th century buildings now. So, right, like yeah. mid-century. Yeah. So and the I new wave of preservation. And I would imagine that in New London, probably 90% of the buildings were built by 1960. <laughs> Right. And, and yeah, and, and we have so many left that are in the 1800s. So. Yeah. And there's no plaque. So we need to get one on there. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I love yeah. going up to the houses and like getting an idea of like how old the house is, how old the, the neighborhood is. Uh, so yeah, um, I highly recommend it to oh, people. I completely forgot. Someone called me, oh, maybe six months ago. And now with all these apps for your mobile, your mobile apps, um, he mentioned that there was a program similar to geocaching, and it was more for cultural landmarks. I wish I would have looked this oh, up yeah. before I came here. And so I sent him the list of plaques that we had to date, and he was going to plug them into this whole mobile wow. app program so that when you're traveling, you, I, get, I guess you get coordinates and then you try to find some historic landmark. Um, so New London Landmarks is part of this app that I can't remember the name of it. Um, so oh, that's, yeah, so it's that's kinda, sounds really fun. It, yeah. it occurs to me that like a scavenger house, yeah. hunt for houses built in a certain decade with yeah. plaques would be really a fun way to tour around New London. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, let's see, I, I Let's see, I wanted to go back and see a couple. Now, New Lighthouse Inn has also much, been much in the, in the news. Mm -hmm. um, what's the prognosis? Does anyone know? Um, I haven't heard. The second RFP went out a long time ago, and I'm not sure what kind of bids have come in. But of course, they'll, yeah. go to, they'll be presented to city council, so um, just waiting to hear what that... And again, I guess the concerns are that the main building, at least, is on the historic register. It right? is, yes. Well, that should help save it, I hope. Um, uh, hopefully. It's history. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted did the gardens. Um, from, from that view, on the opposite side of the building, going all the way down to the ocean, were all fields of wildflowers. And, oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't think I found any photos yet. but yeah. Oh, that's so, really cool. Yeah. I have seen some aerial photos that show the, you know, the semicircle, and the, oh, okay. but not... It was, all, yeah. it was all open. There was no buildings there. Um, oh, wow. But Now, how old is yeah. that building? That must have been from the... Late 1800s? Yeah. Uh, I Sorry, I forgot no, I the building just, the date. And then this, well, going from the south end of town to the north end of town, the Deshaun Allen House is um, near the Lyman Allen Museum yes. on the Con College campus. And the museum owns that building, and they have a new director. They're, you know, stepping forward to do something about that building. I don't know what their plans are yet, but um, it's, they're aware of it and, and concerned. <laughs> well, I, and I think from what I've heard, I haven't met the, the new director, but mm -hmm. it seems as though they want a lot of interaction and connection with the city. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little historic sideline. I just found out, I think today or yesterday, that the fountain that used to be at, at Hodges Square has been in storage at, at Lyman Allen Museum, and they showed it to me last year. Yeah, yeah, and so, and you know yeah. you see the old postcard pictures of the fountain in, in yeah. Hodges Square, and Lyman Allen Museum has said that they'll be willing to let the city put it back in Hodges yeah. Square. Now I have no real hopes that at least in the short term it would really be a water fountain uh, yeah. functioning because there are maintenance issues to deal with. And, but it would be so great to have this fountain that was you know, watering horses. Yeah. And dogs. I saw I it was people, dogs, and horses. Oh, wow. It's original watering usage. <laughs> yeah. That's really, that, that, that's, I did yeah. not know yeah. that. And then this building, I put this one in. It, it is on the endangered list, but I put it in because I worked in that building mm -hmm. uh, 
from nine, about 1980 to 1985, it was owned by TVCCA um, or rented by TVCCA for a child care center. And it's really nice inside. You know, there were two big rooms, hardwood floors, and, um, you know, it, it, but once again, it had the, the typical problems of an old house, not the really old exterior part, but the plumbing had lead pipes and yeah. a lot of asbestos, and, you know, it, it's a great house. And so many people who live in that Home Street Hempstead neighborhood mm -hmm. have fixed up their houses that I'd love to see something happen here as yeah. well. It was there was an it was featured, I think on like an NBC or a news broadcast um, a few months ago. I don't know if you got to see it. I didn't, yeah. but I'd be interested in seeing yeah. what happens with it. It would actually make, I don't know, really nice residents yeah. again. Then there were just a couple others. It, it is sort of unfortunate that the endangered list is long. Mm -hmm. I think and probably growing as people call us and say, <laughs> add this building. <laughs> well, I think about the, the house. I looked at an, an old uh, endangered list, maybe from a year or two ago, uh, when Sandy Chalk was on, on the show, and she was talking about what was endangered in that house that was next oh. to Ocean Pizza that oh, was yes. like disassembled is in boxes somewhere now. Yeah. So that's, I guess. That's a success, almost yeah. half a success. Yes. So it's saved. Now we just need to find a home for it. Right. So it's an in progress thing. Yeah. Yeah. In progress. Yeah. But the Garfield Mill, I don't know, you know, what the. Um, I'll just add to that. Um, our annual meeting in March, um, Bill Krauss is a preservationist and developer, and he restored uh, a mill in, I think, Stratford, and it's now like art studios and residents, and um, he was the one who did the research for the new historic district that I mentioned, oh. and he um, is going to speak to us about his work, the historic district, and ideas he sees for New London, and I think it includes Garfield Mill. Oh, so, like that just, is from a develop a historic preservation developer standpoint, he'll be sharing some of his. Oh, views. that is really yeah, interesting so. because the, that building has always fascinated me. It's like it sort of doesn't look too attractive at first glimpse, yeah. but then. When you look at it closely, I mean, there are high ceilings. Mm -hmm. It's probably built to carry a huge amount of weight and take a lot of abuse. It yeah. could be fantastic. And there's actually two mills next to each yeah. other, two buildings. Yeah, and there's a yeah. little breezeway between yeah. them, which doesn't look very yeah. historic. <laughs> uh, and Franklin Street, this, is, um, this has been in, on the endangered list for a long oh, time. Oh, it's such a and shame. It's, yeah. And it was featured in this old house magazine, and I think they ran a, a little recap of it, saying it's still available. So. Yeah, and really, they're just looking for someone to, to move it. Yeah. And then, let's see, in the south. The yeah, the barn, um, the roof is not in good condition, and, um, and a historic barn in New London, we don't have that. An urban barn? Uh, not yeah. that it was urban at the time, but um, yeah, I think it may, it's pretty special and unique to the city. Yeah, yeah. and I guess it, it speaks to the fact that, you know, if you look at old maps of New London, the population was not that different in 1930 than what it is now, but people lived so much closer to the downtown. I'm, I'm on... Evergreen Avenue, which is just south of the hospital, and my house was built in 1890, but farther south, except for the little pockets like Pequot Colony, mm -hmm. there were, weren't people living down there. Yeah. Everyone lived within about a mile and a half of that downtown core. Yeah, yeah it was all farming. Yeah. The, the original settlers um, each had a lot, like a... a, a 
got a sliver of land down the whole oh, wow. um, like sixth district and there that was their land to farm. So. And then later yeah. it got subdivided yeah. and <laughs> developed. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's um now is that owned by Mitchell College? It is. I guess and here is a private dwelling that's not occupied right now. And it's right near the Bodewine House, which is where the Pequot Hotel used to be. So it's right near the entrance to the Pequot Colony. Um, it's been vacant a while. And then you had mentioned uh, cemeteries, and there are a couple of very old cemeteries in New yeah. London. And I don't know if I got that spelled right, but this one is up on uh, like Hempstead Street and or... By the Buckley School. Yeah. Yeah. And the city takes care of it, but as you know, Parks and Rec are, you know, they're always getting the first right. budget cuts in any municipality. Right. So, um, and volunteer, I've had people call to volunteer to clean it up, but um, liability-wise, you can't operate the equipment as a volunteer. Right. So we're just in this catch-22 phase with taking care of our cemeteries. Um, and then one other cemetery, I knew nothing about this one. Yeah, the Rogers Cemetery is near the, in, on the riverside, close to the Coast Guard and Conn College. And Connecticut College actually is the caretaker for it. So I've only recently, like, have done some findings to see who is responsible. But I've had some concerned citizens say, the cemetery's a mess. Um, and historic... Founder, founders of the city are buried there, so. Yeah, uh, and it's got a sort of a personal connection, so for not so much for me, but for Bob, because his um, great, great, great grandfather was a New London-based Rogerine. Fabulous. Before they went south and then west. So uh, there are ancestors of his buried here, and I... I knew there was a Rogerine Cemetery in Ledger, and mm -hmm. I thought there was one in Quaker Hill, but I knew nothing about this yeah. one. And um, yeah, quite a colorful past, the Rogerines. I'm just reading yeah. for Adam's sake and learning about the history there. So. Yeah, it was, um, they were an interesting group. They had, they're, a lot of their ideas, I think, were ahead of their time. They, Definitely. Um, you know, had a lot more gender equality than most religions at that time and uh, so yeah it's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's kind of a you know, nice thing to know that you come from that stock. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about the Platt program and you mentioned the annual meeting but you have some other upcoming events that uh, sounded really good so we want to tell people about them. Yeah so January, February, March there's something every month uh, annual meetings in March and so we have two programs really worth mentioning. Our film program is in January, and our annual forum is in March. And um, I'm looking at the program for the annual the film series. So it's a collection of short films, um, probably around an hour's worth of films. Most of them aren't, some may be as short as two minutes, and the longest one is like 13 minutes. Um, we open up with a... Um, 1956 Chamber of Commerce um, story, not story, but video about urban renewal and buildings oh. that are obsolete and should be demolished. Um, so it, we're going to the past, and, and then we're seeing um, a little short about Jane Jacobs, um, yeah. you know, fought against yeah. the urban renewal and successfully in a couple of places <laughs> yes in new york city and um so there's a little story about her and then i mean her ideas are now being revitalized and now there's new urbanism and the walkable city so oh. the the next short film is about new urbanism and and it really pulls and new london i mean if you think about walkable cities we so often here, like five square miles, it's like, like it's a problem, mm -hmm. but really it could be, you know, you talked about the, you know, eco-friendliness of, of reusing old buildings. Well, imagine how green it is to walk to work and to walk everywhere you go rather than climb in the car. Mm 
or ride your bike if you're right. a couple miles away. Yeah. So in our small city. So even yeah. you know from Ocean Beach up to Con College is probably five or six miles. Yeah. So that's about as far as you'd ever have to go. Yeah. Th th this is great. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I think that kind of takes us from past to future. And then there's other films that fill in um, the Penn Station, um, stained glass windows at a church, because we have so many here. But this is a church okay. in Tennessee. Um, dumpster pools. Um, there's yeah, a, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> adaptive reuse. An empty lot, taking dumpsters, turning them into swimming pools in an empty lot. Oh, my god! Fun little short. And then... Um, there's an old t tobacco warehouse that's kind of artistically sh shot, um, kind of showing the hope that, you know, it's not quite left behind. That's what it's called. And there's one fiction piece that's called Not Shown for Cl Clarity. And there's actually a short trailer on our website, which is newlandandlandmarks.org. And um, it's great, especially if you like VWs. Um, a guy driving an old VW goes into a lot where he thinks was an old VW dealer, and he ends up encountering a cast of preserved figures. There's an architect, two hippies, and, and they're driving a little VW bug, and here this was this old VW dealer, and it's vacant, it's abandoned, <laughs> and it just brings up a lot of like preservation philosophy. And um, I, so, oh, and... and Capitol Theaters mentioned, Drew Wilson, who has a show here, is an art here right. now. Um, he has a short film about the Capitol Theater, and uh, so there's something local. And um, then we have a discussion with Rick Gibstein. He's a local architect and, um, and a film enthusiast. He teaches a film class in New London um, oh, yeah. at the BP Learner Center where we're having this. It's a great little space. It is. Um, I yeah. was... I wasn't aware of the space until yeah. last year when you showed him oh, a, a film, film yeah. the DeCavit one, I think. Yeah, that from the ashes. Yes, yeah. uh, but yes, it's a fantastic space. Yeah. It's like it's perfect for little events. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So, um, so we have him. So it should be a really, you know. So, what's the date of that, oh. and how do people? Do they sign up ahead of time or you, show up at the door? You or? can. It's Thursday, January 22nd. Doors open at 6.30. We'll probably start the films at 7, so you can little mingle a little. And it's $10 or $5 if you're a member. You can either pay at the door, and um, or you can buy your tickets ahead of time online. There's PayPal. So that's the so that's it. Okay, yeah. so that's January, and that's that sounds January. like a lot of fun. That's coming up. And then our annual meeting, our annual forum is Tuesday, February 24th. And um, it's on endangered buildings. Um, one of the things, I'm responding to a lot of feedback I heard in my first year um, as director of New London Landmarks, is we have all these endangered buildings. What are you doing? What can we do? And, and this forum is to present all the different tools that are out there, um, legal tools, not, you know, how do you restore a window, right. um, but what can we do um, to be more proactive? And, and Alan Plattis of Yale School of Design will lead uh, a panel, he'll moderate a panel discussion, and we'll have breakout sessions afterwards to apply what we've learned to and make try to come up with solutions for our local um, community, um, but we're going to have um, the director from the Providence Preservation Society is going to be on our panel. He they actually have a formal endangered building list, and oh, wow. from Landmarks, I would like to learn what their system is, how extensive, what's their process, so that we have more than just some names on a website. What can right. we do to be more active? Um, they also have a revolving fund, which lends money out to homeowners. Um, we don't have anything like that. Um, so it might be something to have in the future. And then- I'm thinking that legal and financial tools are really essential yeah. if, we, if we want people to do something. And then there's like these new forms of zoning that aren't as 
strict as like see so we only have yeah. one local historic district which is star street and people that live on there like if they change their window they pay right. they have to go to the the commission well there's some others called preservation ordinance and village district zoning these things are not quite as require bureaucratic red tape right. um and I don't know much about them, but we'll, we'll be having experts there sh who in cities that have them, and then they can share their experiences with us. Um, so well, that's interesting to me. Okay. It's actually been part of the Green Party platform for at least a decade that zoning should concentrate more on what happens to the building than exactly what people are using it for. Because, you know, as times change, desired uses might evolve yeah. and change, but you want the building to always fit into its surroundings, whatever people are using it for. So sometimes it seems like we're, we've are we been kind of lax and let people make changes to buildings that don't, they, they wreck the streetscape yeah. uh, and, and worry too much about how many people, how many bedrooms there are there or whether a person is up, you know, yeah. but the building, you know, preservation, you know, should be at least one of the main things we focus on. So hopefully we'll be able to learn from other cities and then look at it for our city and see what we can do. And then historic tax credits, which I mentioned earlier, yeah. that'll be presented because Individuals can use that, and so can developers. Um, so there's commercial tax credits, there's residential tax credits, so that's something that's... Now, so, and, yeah. and that can be signed up for online too, or do you want... Yes, you can register online, it's already on the website. And, um, and we are sending out an invitation to our mailing list um, probably in two, within the next two weeks. And it'll have all our, these events that we just mentioned um, on an invitation. So, and we'll have loose ones in the office if you're not on our list. So. so that sounds great too. Yeah. And you mentioned the annual meeting before, but maybe you want to talk a little Ooh. bit more about it. So obviously annual meeting, you're in a review, special speaker, which we're having Bill Krause come, a uh, little reception, so it's a little social. And, um, and then you get to see something, some new, some interesting building. Okay. And this year it's at Mike's Harley-Davidson. Oh, yeah. Speaking of so. restoration success stories in New London. That's another one. Um, that I must say, I haven't been inside. And so. Adopter Reeves. Oh, it's really great. <laughs> uh, so the old Coca-Cola plant on Boston Post Road or Bank Street, it's still Bank Street then. And, um, and he actually, I spoke to him last year shortly after they opened, I think, and um, he has his heart in preservation. He I, worked on some building that a dealer is in in, Mar in Delaware. So he also like cared oh. about some architecture down there and he's applying his concerns up here and the building's great, um, super adaptive reuse. And he even like saved some, you know, doors that were hidden and um but if you come to the annual meeting you'll get to see his space um okay and what's okay. the date oh for the the date tuesday march 31st and um 5 30 to 7 30 and it's free but we ask you to rsvp and that you can do on the website already now it's all signed up and i forgot i wanted to mention the endangered buildings forum it's an all-day workshop which is our typical format um, continental right. breakfast, panel discussion, lunch, breakout sessions, and then go home. And it's $30 admission or $25 for members. And that's really yeah. nice. Having gone to the last couple of years, mm -hmm. it's really fun to learn about something and then break out into groups oh, nice. and try to come up with some solutions, yeah, ideas. And I think um, last year, one of the breakout groups was talking about... Um, the water taxi. They were. And yeah. the Heritage Park. And, you know, and it's, it's coming together. It right? is. Yeah. So it's kind of fun to talk about things. And sometimes that's just the impetus it needs to. Yeah. To, of course, to they were together. working on that for a they long were. time. But it was nice. Yeah, to, it wasn't just this yeah. group. <laughs> yeah. But it was kind yeah. of nice to be able to think about some of the 
details and yeah. other potential stakeholders. Yeah. Now, if people, other than going to your meetings, if mm -hmm. people want to get involved with Landmarks, uh, either to volunteer or to learn more or to financially support your organization, what should they do? Call or email. Um, I, I can meet you. You could stop in the office. Um, we have resources, a couple of brochures, like on historic tax credits and a couple of like low interest loans for restoration projects. We, we also have information on a lot of houses. We may have old photos of your house, depending where it was. Um, and um, we could really use volunteers. I mean, we have a whole bunch of programs I haven't even mentioned that we're thinking about and planning for the coming year. And we could use all kind of help. So what um, kind of things might a volunteer do? Um, well, one is we might have this old house show so like a home show for old homeowners so we'll need help build doing internet search to find vendors oh. like companies that specialize in historic renovation um so internet research mailings you know stamping yeah. mailings um taking photos of buildings so we could like and promote our endangered buildings like on facebook or website um and then event planning so that yeah. sounds yeah. fun. And I just wanted to mention, we have like three more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, going to your website, there are actually a lot of other resources available. Mm -hmm. You have some publications. You have some walking tours, things. You have some information about the neighborhoods. So I want to give a pitch to that. Thank you. We have a <laughs> lot. And we're going to do another resource page with more resources. That's coming in the next year. So. Uh, well, that sounds great. Give the date of the film, since that's the next thing. The next thing. No. Thursday, January 22nd, doors open at 630, BP Learnard Center, which is 40 Shaw Street, which is right behind Walgreens on Bank Street. And, and it's sort of a side entrance. A side entrance. Yeah. And it is a great space. I yeah. highly, highly recommend it. Well, thank you, Constance. Thank you, Rada. Uh, and I hope people come to, to these events because they really are fun. I try to get to most of them. Thanks. And it's really been a lot of fun. And I hope you've been having a lot of fun doing this in New London over the last year. I love this stuff. Yeah, it's very rewarding. Um, well, that's... A, yeah. So people can go to the Landmarks website or call or email. Mm -hmm. And um, so thank you. And uh, next week, I just want everyone to know... Uh, we're actually really changing gears. I have a student named Tyler Williams who is, um, goes to UConn and is a member of SSDP, Students for Sensible Drug Policy. And he is going to be talking from a youth standpoint about what drug policy can look like. So we'll see you next week. And thank you again, Constance. And I'll see you, thank you out Lee. in New London. Yes, thanks. <laughs>